Good afternoon. My name is John Todd, and I lead the system architecture team at Okta. My team works across the product to improve scalability and security. In this session, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to present to you guys how we're using KMS at Okta in a multi-region environment. In addition to talking about Amazon's key management service, we're also going to touch a bit on um, identity and access management, IAM, cloud trail and how we're doing auditing, uh, the Java SDK, mostly for KMS, and how we look at the security model um, running our applications within EC2. We'll do a brief background on Okta and a couple uh, short intros on some encryption concepts that we'll be using later. And then the meat of the conversation is going to be about how we're thinking about the security model that KMS provides, how we became comfortable with that at Okta, and then the infrastructure and architecture we built to be uh, fault tolerant across multiple regions. Let's get one thing out of the way real quick. Uh, sh with a show of hands, let's see if anyone knows what an Okta actually is. Raise your hand if you think Okta is an eight-legged creature. OK, there's no one who thinks that. Um, how about raise your hand if you think Okta is a unit of measure? OK, there's like 10. Cool. Uh, how about an abbreviation? One, two, three, OK. And what about a made-up name for a company? All right, that's like almost everybody. OK. Well, actually, Okta is a word. It is a unit of measure. And it's a unit measure for cloud cover. It's used by aviators and sailors to basically, on a scale from 0 to 8, describe how much visibility there is. Oop, that's not working. OK, there we go. What is Okta? Okta is the foundation for secure connections between people and technology. So if you see from our screenshots from a user's perspective, what we're trying to make really simple and easy is for people to get access to the applications they need on any platform, any device, as simply and quickly as possible. If you think about the Okta product, you can put it into two different categories. For IT space, Okta provides a centralized management of users, apps, and devices. So that means we do things like single sign-on. We do provisioning of accounts to third-party systems. We offer multi-factor authentication. And we offer uh, device management. For developers, we offer the ability for you to build enterprise apps without having to deal with the details of building your own authentication. We have customers like Advent and Adobe who use our product to do authentication for all of their customers. So if you think about the scale of Okta, where we first started to focus on identity for employees, with the developer model, we're also thinking about identities for customers and partners of our, of our customers. If you're interested in more information, check out um, either of the websites for uh, a lot more detail. Okta is a mid-sized company, and we have traction across 2,000 customers in every vertical. From tech companies like Twitter and LinkedIn, to manufacturing like Boeing and Tesla, healthcare companies like WebMD, Blue Cross Blue Shield, and of course, right here in Vegas, the MGM Gram. Okta manages tens of millions of identities on a multi-tenant architecture built entirely on AWS. And we have a team of about 600 people and about 130 engineers. Our product is used in 185 countries around the world. And this is a brief overview of, of some of the technologies we use to support Okta. We're big fans of open source technology, and we're huge users of the AWS platform. 
you'd like to get a lot more information about our stack, check out stackshare.io. Um, and one of the great things about our product and being a developer is that we dog food our product every day. All right, enough of the sales pitch. Let's dig into some crypto. So why do we, why do we use encryption in the first place? From a fundamental perspective, we're using crypto because we want to have data confidentiality. We want to limit the access to that data to only the people who have access to the keys. With newer algorithms, you may also get authenticity guarantees. You might be able to provide some additional context in your encryption to validate that no one has changed or altered that data, either in transit or at rest. But practically, why are we all here in this room talking about crypto? It's probably because you either have a compliance reason or because you're trying to do right by your customers. And to define what do right by your customers is, it's, it's really adhering to the least privilege principle. Don't give access to someone or some system that doesn't need it in the first place. So that's the way we think about security at Okta and why we were so excited to, to move to KMS. The problem with encryption is that you take a bunch of data, you encrypt it, and now you've made it confidential. But now you have some other data that you need to somehow keep confidential, and it's the keys. And so effectively what you're doing is you're moving the problem from a larger set of data to something small that might be slightly more manageable. So before we get into key management, think about your application and whether or not you actually need to have access to plain text data or to keys. So for some examples there, if you're doing um, use cases like authentication or correlation, where you don't actually need the plain text value, it would be OK to operate on a hashed value that you're comparing, then consider using hashing. There are also use cases where you're working on encrypted data, but you don't need access to the keys. In a homomorphic application, you'd be able to, provide, you'd be able to do operations on top of your encrypted data. These could be things like ordering or range queries. And a great example of this is the CryptDB paper out of MIT, where they took the MySQL database and offered almost every operation that database can perform on encrypted data. Next, you may only require encrypt, right? Let's, let's consider the case where you have an ingest endpoint that's publicly available, but then that service doesn't actually need to decrypt the data. In that scenario, you could use asymmetric crypto, put public keys out on your ingest servers, but they don't actually need to be doing decrypt. Again, think about least privilege principle and how these fundamentals can help. The last one is the trust no one model. And this is kind of another way of saying client-side crypto, right? Your service doesn't have to deal with cryptographic keys if you don't ever work on the plain text data. You don't need it. You allow the client to do the encryption, and then they send you the ciphertext, and you never decrypt it. You can take that one step forward because you might say, well, OK, sure, we could put it on the client, but then how does the client deal with keys? So in a lot of trust no one models, you can do a key derivation based on something that the person knows rather than something that's stored on disk. So this could be something like a password vault where you take your password and then use that to derive a key that then is used to encrypt your data. So these are a bunch of different examples for how to get confidentiality without having to manage keys. If, if your application must have access to the plain text data, then we start to talk about uh, moving over to a key server and why that's beneficial. To illustrate this, I want to use an example. Let's consider a simple case where a client has some plain text data that they want to send to your service. So they send it over a, a trusted channel that's encrypted, but when it arrives at your service, it's now in plain text again. And let's think about some of the requirements that your service might have if you're trying to follow good security practices. So for one, you probably want a model where the cryptographic keys are only in memory, not on disk. There's a number of different attacks where someone might be able to gain access to that. Two, 
Following the least privileged principle, there's no reason that anyone who has access to the database needs to have this, the plain text version of that data, both at rest and in memory. So that means that we're going to be doing the encryption in our service and then storing cipher te text down in the database. The problem with this, of course, is how do you get that key onto that service? So naively, we might do something at like server, server boot up where we put it into an environment variable with some config management system or into a file. I hope most people know why that's not a good idea. There's tons of documentation online about, about why that's not a great idea. The next model would be enforcing that that key is only accessible in memory. And so to do that, you'd have to do something where you're providing the key to the service at runtime over a secure channel. That's the model that Okta had been using for a while before we moved to the key management service. And of course, the last option is to take those keys out of your service and move them into a key management service. So with a key service, we add a new component to this architecture. We still encrypt the data with a data key that's generated within the service. Or potentially, you could go ask the key service to give you a generated key. But the important part here is that the encryption still happens on the service, but then what's stored in the database is a combination of two things. The encrypted plain text that was provided to you and an encrypted version of the key that came out of the key service. We, Amazon refers to this as envelope encryption. So with this model, the, the benefit is that the key that's actually rooting your trust lives in a key service, and it never leaves that service. This creates a really nice seam in your application, because now the key service interface is easy to audit. And you can look at your service and compare and reconcile the log data to make sure that every request that's been made to that service is one that you were expecting. Also, because the, the key service's master key is opaque to your application, it allows the key service to rotate the master key opaquely to your application. As long as your application records which version of the master key was used to encrypt that data, you'll be able to continually add new master keys, and the new data that's being encrypted will use those new master keys, and you'll still be able to decrypt the data that was encrypted with old master keys. The last benefit of this model is that in the earlier approach, the key that was used for doing crypto lived in memory for the entire lifetime of that server being up. When you move to a key service, you now can make just-in-time requests for your, your uh, cryptographic keys at the cost of performance trade-offs. So now let's dig into how we actually went through this process of rolling out and um, looking at the KMS uh, offering from Amazon. At Okta, our encryption use cases are twofold. We have customer data that we want to keep private, like PII, PCI, and PHI. And we store users' credentials. So these were our requirements. And let's look at how the requirements matched up with what KMS offers. First, we wanted strong encryption. And KMS offers that with industry standard 256-bit AES GCM. In addition to that, they're able to provide hardware-enabled strong random number generator. Next, we wanted separation of duties. And this is a, a critical part of what a key service gives you, and that the team that's managing the key service, if it's different from the team that's managing your data, it means that no one person has both access to your keys and to your data. And that's given to you by design of using KMS. So by rolling out to KMS, we no longer needed to have our operators have access to those keys. And that means when they leave, we don't have to deal with the same rotation models that we'd have to have if they did have access. In addition, Amazon themselves have quorum-based manage and separate, 
sorry, quorum-based management and separation of duties in their own management of the KMS service. Next, we wanted to be able to support auto scale. So I mentioned that the only secure way without using a key management service to have the keys only reside in memory is to provide them to the service um, at, at startup time. So the problem with that is you need an operator there to be able to provide those keys. And so by using the, the KMS IAM uh, bootstrapping model for getting credentials onto our EC2 instances, we were able to take advantage of um, that approach for allowing us to bootstrap servers and auto scale them without having an op operator there. Lastly, we wanted auditability, and of course, you get that with encryption context and CloudTrail. Now let's dig into the threat model um, and take a look at the security off posture that KMS has in our architecture. So if we look at the diagram that we had before, we're replacing this generic concept of your service with specifically running within EC2, and we're, we're replacing the generic concept of a key server with KMS. Let's dig into Amazon EC2 first and see the model that they're using there. So of course, now that you have all your keys moved over a key man to a key management service, you now have another problem, which is how do you get the credentials to be able to talk to the key management service? So the solution for this is to use IAM roles for EC2. This allows you to tell uh, IAM that you want a particular role to have access to a particular set of keys within KMS. And then you can associate that role with a, a set of instances. So if you go and look at what the SDK would be doing, if you were to just say, use the default security provider for getting credentials to KMS, it would make a request to the metadata service within uh, EC2. And for those who aren't familiar, every EC2 instance is launched with access to the static IP where you're able to query for a bunch of different metadata information about the service. One of the things that you can query for is the credentials to talk to KMS. So we dug into that a bit. And if you take those credentials off of that machine and you use it on another machine, it does work. But the team has put in place short-lived credentials. So if someone were to gain access to them, they would live for a short period of time. We wanted to understand more about that, so we dug in. If you look at the, the response you get, when you, you get um, when you perform a request for credentials, you get an access key ID, a secret access key, and a signed token. And if you compare the expiration time with the last updated date, you find that their credentials are rotated every hour, but they're good for six hours. So if you think about, could I do this better myself? We thought the answer was no, because the hardest part of this is bootstrapping those credentials to that machine. And Amazon has a distinct advantage in that they operate below your EC2 instance at the hypervisor layer where they have access to hardware. The next part of the threat model will talk about transport security. So here, there's nothing surprising. Transport is secured by TLS for confidentiality and authentication of the server side. If you go through in more detail, they get an A rating on Qualys, and they're generally following all the best practices, including requiring forward secrecy, which may mean that some older clients would not work. And then the authentication and authorization of the client side is done via that IAM signature that we saw in the response from the metadata service. Lastly, let's dig into KMS. There's a great white paper called the KMS Cryptographic Details that has a lot more information on how they've built and secure KMS. This diagram comes from that, and I highly recommend that people go and use that. 
I just want to talk through two main points about how their, their model works. The first one is to talk about customer master keys. So when you go to the UI in KMS and you create a new customer master key, you may notice that you have the ability to set some amount of time before it will rotate that key. So clearly this customer master key is a logical concept and underneath that logical concept there may be multiple actual keys that are used to encrypt your data. Those actual keys are called the HSA backing keys. Those are the HBKs in this diagram. And the second thing I want you to take away from this is that the HSA, while it's not a hardware security module that has tamper-proof um, tamper -proof access to the, the keys, it is in most ways acting exactly like an HSM. And that the keys that are used to encrypt your data only live within the HSM in memory. And they never leave the service unless they've been encrypted. For durability, they do export them. Those are, they call those exported key tokens. But when they're exported, they're exported in an encrypted fashion by a key that's rotated daily. So if we wrap it all up, you basically have three options when you're looking to do encryption in the cloud with uh, AWS. The first option would be to use Cloud HSM. Cloud HSM gives you an actual HSM hardware appliance, and you now need to own all of the HA um, and uptime of that service. From a cost perspective, Cloud HSM is also expensive both upfront and ongoing. And if you were trying to do it yourself, you'd have to do all the stuff that we just talked about in the threat model, and you still wouldn't have the advantage of having access to the hardware. You would, for example, have to have a separate operations team to do your separation of duties within your organization. For a small startup, that's very hard to, to justify doing. So from a cost perspective, we found that KMS would cost us under $1,000 a month Cloud HSM would be somewhere around $20,000 a month. And do it yourself. You do the math on how long you think your team would take to build all that functionality. It would be very expensive. So now let's dig into how we implemented KMS at Okta. Okta is a multi-region service. We guarantee to our customers that if a region goes down in Amazon, we will be able to have them up and running on another region, regardless of how long it takes Amazon to bring that region back up. So we have a master region and a DR region. In addition, if you think about how important this infrastructure is to our product, if we can't get access to our crypto keys, we can't do what our company does. So in addition to having this DR multi-region failover, we wanted to have a solution where even if K KMS had a bug where they corrupted their data or they lost our keys or they went down entirely, we would have a way to still get at our encrypted data. It, along those same lines, that means we also wanted to avoid vendor lock-in. And what I mean by that is not that we want to avoid you know, locking into just their API. Their API is very simple and lightweight. What I'm more concerned about is we, didn't want, we don't want to lock in to having to actually go to every ciphertext blob in every data store that we have and have to re-encrypt that data if we were to move elsewhere. So you have to think about what kind of key hierarchy you're going to want to be able to support that. And lastly, we were moving from a model where our cryptographic keys were in memory. They were right there with our service. And now we need to go out over the network to make a request every time we want those keys. So performance was a huge uh, impact and, and something we spent a lot of time looking at. Okta was encrypting data before we moved to KMS. So we already had a key hierarchy in place. So as I mentioned before, we used to have a model where we would provide keys to our servers at runtime. 
that key that we were providing was the region master key. The region master key then encrypts a key per tenant. That way, every single tenant's data is encrypted under a separate master key hierarchy. And then that master key is then used to encrypt data keys that actually encrypt our data. So when we moved to KMS, what we were able to do is move our root of trust from this key that an operator has to provide at runtime to our service into the KMS service where we never have access to that key. And then if you, if you think about how we did this in practice, we were able, because we had this key hierarchy, we were able to keep both running in parallel when we went to roll this out. So what I mean by that is we took our existing region master key and we kept deploying that to our service. We then took every tenant master key that we had and we kept the old encrypted version and we re-encrypted it with KMS. So that moves the root of trust both into KMS and to the key that we already have. And we were able to do that because we have this third layer where the, the key that's actually protecting our encrypted data is one layer below that. So using an extended key hierarchy does give you some advantages, but it comes with some costs. It made the adoption of KMS easier because we were able to gradually roll out, and we, would ha we had a rollback strategy if something didn't work. It also means that the keys that we actually protect with KMS are few. There, there's just one per tenant. So they're innumerable. We can find them. We can rotate them if we need to. Both a pro and a con is that the model that we're using means that we don't actually call the KMS API when we're encrypting our data. We only use it to protect the tenant master keys. So that means that we have to manage the security of the code that's actually encrypting our data. We, we run our own, our own uh, cryptographic system, and we have to get that reviewed periodically. So the pro is that you have more control there, and the con is, of course, that you have more responsibility. The last thing to mention is in the service-to-service -service model where you're encrypting data and sending it to another service, the issue is that now because your data is being encrypted not by KMS but by a separate key hierarchy that you control, you can't rely on the receiving service to have access to the keys that are actually used to encrypt that data. So if you're using this hierarchical model, you need to think about a different solution to that. We didn't have that problem. Now let's talk about how we mitigated for failure. So again, because we have this key hierarchy, we were able to root the encryption of that tenant master key in multiple places. Just like we did with rollout, where we rooted it in our old region master key and then the new KMS key, we were also able to root it in multiple KMSs and with an RSA key. So what this allows us to do is make a request to decrypt one of our tenant master keys from one KMS. If that goes down, we can make a request to the other KMS. And if that doesn't work, then our server doesn't have the ability to decrypt that data. The reason why is because this RSA key that we're using is only the public key that's placed on that server. So when we create new tenants, we can always encrypt it with that public key for RSA, but we can't decrypt it with what's currently deployed in our fleet. That said, if we do hit that scenario, we can bring two people together to push the private key, the private RSA key to those servers in the case that all of KMS is down or that they've somehow lost our keys. So how did this actually work in practice? On September 20th, KMS had a heightened error rate for about uh, two hours. 
This is the graph of the requests from our service out to KMS. Right around 5.30, we started to see a heightened error rate. And then around 5.45, it got pretty high. And what you're seeing here is that our, our service is continually making requests to the US East region, but now we're also going out to the US West region. Those requests are succeeding, and we're then able to decrypt our data. Our operations team doesn't even get paged or woken up, and we continue operating. Okta takes transparency very seriously, and so if you're interested to learn a little bit more about our service uptime, take a look at trust.okta.com. Now let's talk about authorization and auditing. And, and the critical part of authorization and auditing is the encryption context. So as I mentioned, the KMS API is very simple. We only use three operations. We use encrypt, decrypt, and generate data key. All three of those operations allow you to provide encryption context. It's additional data that's both used in the encryption algorithm and it's also used when logging. And so if you think about how do you come up with what your encryption context should be, what you're really thinking about is what, how will I answer the question of what data is being encrypted or decrypted when I go and look at my logs? You're also trying to answer the question, how will I create a security policy to manage access to my keys? So the way we thought about it at Okta is the encryption context should do two things. It should identify your data, tell you what's being encrypted, what's being decrypted, and it should classify your data. And typically classification is the way that you're, you're structuring your policy for what systems have access to certain keys. So in, in our concrete example, we ended up with service name and entity name as the classification of the data and then an opaque identifier as the way to find out what record is actually being operated on. There's a few things to note about the encryption context. The first is that it's immutable. If you can't provide that value at every decryption, you won't be able to decrypt your data. So you need to come up with something that is going to either be a property of the data you're encrypting that won't change and is immutable, or it's something that's stored right alongside your data. I highly recommend not hard coding your encryption context into your code, but storing it alongside your data so that you may evolve the way that you model your encryption context over time and still allow the old records that you've already stored to have their old encryption context model and allowing you to then swap in the new one. Lastly, because it's in log data, don't put anything sensitive there. Our entity IDs that we're putting into the encryption context are completely new opaque identifiers for our service and, and have no meaning publicly with our service. So if someone were to get both access to the plain text keys in KMS and the encryption context or CloudTrail logs, they still wouldn't know how to tie that back to the entities within Okta. So the main takeaway is if you don't use encryption context, then the best you can do from a policy perspective is you can say, allow these actions for these keys to this role. If you want more granular policy, if you want to be able to say, allow access to this key, but only for this subset of data that's classified this way, then you need to use encryption context. And so this illustrates an example of that, where our directory app role is a role that we're gonna to assign to some directory app servers. And what this policy is saying is only allow the decrypt operation if the encryption context that was provided has a key of type and a value of directory service sensitive object. And now let's take a look at the CloudTrail logs. This is where your encryption context 
and key information will show up in CloudTrail. In addition, there's a lot of helpful information provided in the CloudTrail logs that if you're bringing this into your SIM or whatever security monitoring tools you're using, it can allow you to build reconciliation tools and whitelists for what you would expect for access to KMS. One example, and this, you might be wondering, why do we have like a suspicious activity log that actually has data on it? This was when we were tuning the process. But this is an example where we're reconciling our data between our app and the key server. So we want to know, did every decryption event that happened in KMS correspond to a request that came from our service? And if the answer is no, we want to know why. Now let's talk about how we rolled out the service and, and did some tuning. So like I said before, because of the encryption hierarchy that we have, we were able to have a model where we could roll back. So we flighted out our deployment to a subset of our customers using KMS. We waited about a day, and when, when, when that went well, we rolled it out to the rest of the fleet. I'll get back to that tuning bit in a minute. When we were looking at the performance numbers in production, we saw that the cost of making one of these requests was up around 61 milliseconds, which for our product would be about a third of the time that we spend responding to any of our requests, which isn't gonna be acceptable for us. So like I said before, moving from a model where you provide a key to the service that stays there for the entire lifetime of the service being up, when you move to KMS, you get this nice option of tunable, uh, tunability in terms of how long you keep your keys in memory. You could use them just in time and only once. You could use them for a very short period of time and then age them out. So because we didn't want to have this new 61 millisecond overhead on every one of our requests. We chose to have a short time to live on our uh, encryption keys, which is that tuning um, portion that you see about a week after we deployed KMS. Next, when we rolled out KMS, we found that we were failing over to the West region more than we were expecting. When we dug into it a bit, it was typically due to just standard socket and connection timeouts. And we noticed that the SDK that we were using was not retrying more than once when it was calling out to, to KMS. So if you're using the Java SDK, here's a good example of some settings that are working well for us in production. Socket timeout of three seconds, connection timeout of three seconds, and retrying three times. When we did that, we basically have not seen our service switch over to the other region unless there was a, a high error rate. So we're very pleased with the KMS service. There's definitely a few things we'd love to see in addition to what they're already offering. The first is support for multi-region encryption not dictating exactly how that would have to work, but just something that would allow other people to do something similar to what we're doing without having to have a complex key hierarchy. Next, there's some security improvements where, for example, we can add additional layer of encryption over the standard TLS that they're using when talking between KMS and our service. For cases like Heartbleed, this would mean that the, the data still would be encrypted. Next, the tokens that are being issued to EC2 services, there's room for improvement and potentially binding them, maybe channel binding to IP or channel binding to the TLS session. And lastly, we'd love to see what they're already offering for symmetric key cryptography to be offered for asymmetric key cryptography and if they could offer a certificate authority as a service rooted in a publicly trusted domain, I'm sure a lot of people could think of scenarios that where that would be very helpful. 
Our takeaway is that the service is highly available. If you were going to go and try to build this yourself, despite the small blip that they've had, it's still a very hard problem to solve. And if you are solving it across region, they have a fantastic solution. It's extremely simple to get up and running. A short aside on this is that at Okta, we have a hackathon every quarter. Our developers get a chance to come up with ideas that they think would be interesting, small teams, and they go and they implement something. KMS actually came out of three people getting together and in one day implementing this solution. And then that team got voted on to then roll this out into production. They were given an extra two weeks to do this. And those two weeks were basically spent just making sure that the migration path going out to production was going to work properly. That's incredible two weeks to completely change your root of trust for crypto. The last thing, as we mentioned before, it's orders of magnitude cheaper and enables a lot of additional features, most importantly, separation of duties. If you're going to roll out KMS, make sure you need to deal with keys in the first place. Put thought into your encryption context because it's very hard to change later. Remember that the data is, that's in there needs to be immutable and think about identification and classification. Reconcile your cloud trail logs with your application logs. If you're not actually looking at the data that's coming out of cloud trail, you don't know if anyone is trying to do something malicious with your key server. Tune the SDK for timeouts and definitely for retries. And lastly, consider an extended key hierarchy if you want some of these benefits we've talked about, like uh, avoiding vendor lock-in, enabling multiple routes of trust. Um, but remember that it does come with some additional complexity if you have a multi-service model. Lastly, there's a few resources that were pretty helpful along the way. The first one gives you some information about permission modeling. The second one is that white paper I was talking about with details for KMS. And the final one is helpful when you start to get to coding. Thanks, everyone. Please uh, remember to fill out your evaluations. I want to give a shout out to our team real quick of Kobe and Paul Nguyen, who um, were the other members of that hackathon team and uh, brains behind this. Thank you so much for your time.